let's flip it on the devil tonight and let's get caught up in the counsel of God and then let's start talking about what God's saying. But see, God has been saying things, but people haven't been doing them. It's, it's, an, old, it's an old thing. It's not a new thing. It's always been that way. God speaks and people don't listen and they don't do it. They don't hear it, but they don't act on it. And this is because of fear. So I, I really suggest that you come to, to the next couple of nights because I'm going to be talking about fear. But if you can't make it, you can watch it online. But fear stops people. And I think, honestly, I think it's a fear of failure. And I think it's the failure of the unknown. But really, Paul said that all these things were mysteries until this present time. He said that now they've been revealed, they've been unveiled, the, the, the drapes have been drawn back. And the mystery of the ages has been revealed, honestly. And that there, the deep mysteries of God are revealed by the Spirit. So why wouldn't you want to emphasize the Spirit of God more? He's so willing to counsel us. He is the counselor. And he's the master of his realm. I mean, who else is the master of the spirit realm but the spirit himself? Right? So he can grab you and take you there. And uh, I guarantee you're not going to be the same when you come back. And that's if you come back. And I guarantee you, if you go some places, you won't want to come back. Because up there in heaven, people don't fall upstairs. They don't fall up their stairs. When, when people talk up there, you never say, I have no idea what they're saying. They're not making any sense. There's none of that. Nobody says, six feet, buddy. You don't have that. There's no, there's no, there's no limitations. But see, heaven is really what it was supposed to be with, with us. And heaven on earth was God's idea from the beginning. And so you have to remember this stuff. And um, it, you're already starting to feel better. Right now. I mean, even right now, because the Spirit of God is here to heal tonight. And you're going to see people get healed. Let's start with you. Right? And, and, you know, no one will have to touch you. No one will have to touch you. Because he sent his word, right? And that heals. Amen. Sent his word and it heals. He healed those in Psalms 107, you know, even an angel could accidentally brush up against you and you can get healed by accident because the life of God is in them. That's why when an angel shows up, it shifts everything. It really does. It's going to shift. It's shifting in this room right now. That's why I'm just standing here. I'm going to keep, keep just talking until, until it's, it's done and then I'm going to open my notes. But this is better. Waiting on God is better. So the whole room's going to fill up. And I just want to know where, where the rest of Seattle is. Because I came, I came here the first time. They were standing against the wall in this room. And it's only been a month, a month or two, maybe three. I don't know. But the Lord told me to go. And he said, if you don't go now, it's, it's closing up. And so I said, okay. So we squeezed this in. We added this to the trip. And um, so when I was praying, I was praying, amen. I was praying, I was praying like you do, and in the spirit, and, uh, you know, King County came up in English, and I said, okay, and I said, okay, what's going on? Why are we going to Seattle so soon? I told him I was coming next year. He says, you got to go now, or you're not going. I said, what? So I looked up King County website, and right there on the top, it says, yesterday, they passed a, a law saying that by the 25th, in order to have a function with any more than 500 people, you have to have been vaccinated. And you have to show your card at the door to any hotel, any kind of venue, or you have to prove that you've been tested within the, la in the last 24 hours. I said, okay, God, you know, of course you're always right. So I came now. And then we've scheduled it for August so we can give your government up here some time to come to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And amen. You kind of work it out, you know, work it out, whatever, whatever working it out is. You know, I'm not sure what they're working out. I'm not sure what's going on right now. But in God's kingdom, 
He knows exactly what's going on. And he's going to send his word and heal you. That's all I can tell you. And that's all I can do is show up and preach the good news, which Jesus preached. The good news was you don't have to be sick. You don't have to be poor. You don't have to have devils. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to die. You could actually be raised from the dead. You know, is, is, that, is that something like, you, think about it. Nobody's preaching healing anymore or raising the dead. But, you know, God's still the same as he was, you know, two years ago. You know, it used to be the pig flu, you know, and the bird flu. And now it's a bat flu. And all of a sudden, God doesn't heal anymore. Oh, no, you're like, oh, how can he just stand up there and do it? I'm not going to get sick. I, I, I'm just telling you. Psalms 91 is my insurance policy, and I keep my premiums up, all right? I pay my premiums. Amen. The, 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 the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is dwelling in me, and it's quickening my mortal body. I'm always coming down with a healing. Now, I'm not just saying that to brag. I'm, I'm trying to show you something about what Jesus said. Jesus was quoting Psalms 91 when he said, You shall trample on serpents and scorpions and have power over all the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. If you put that back into Hebrew, it is exactly what is said in Psalms 91. He was quoting Psalms 91. Because he was writing the New Testament because he was the New Testament. So he didn't have a New Testament to, to talk about. You know, to quote, I mean. He was talking about it. He was writing the New Testament because he was the New Testament. So Paul didn't have the New Testament. He, he was writing it. You get it? So they had to quote the Old Testament because it's a type and shadow, it says. If you read the book of Hebrews, you won't have any more questions about all this. But that's kind of hard because you'd rather just come and hear me talk about it. That's good. But you've got to start studying on your own. Okay, so devils, devils don't know what to do. Now, I mean this. And I, oh, you're like waiting me for to get this dreadful disease. I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to get. I'm not going down in a plane crash. I'm not going to get in a car wreck. Amen. No one's going to touch me because I believe in Psalms 91. Amen. Okay, you think that that's not bragging? That's my covenant right. But that's your covenant right. Did Jesus worry about getting leprosy when he was laying hands on the lepers? Okay, well, why? Because virtue was coming out of him. What did he say about us? There shall be rivers of living water flowing out of your belly into, into eternal life. Well, that's where we're all going. But don't you think that Paul was correct when he said that we have that deposit in us now guaranteeing the full payment when we go to heaven? Or is, you know, was he just talking? Was he just preaching? You know, like, like preaching is not true. Oh, that's just Paul, you know. Oh, you know, they, they just say that. It's like, no, Jesus isn't like that. When he says something, he means it. When his apostles speak, they wrote New Testament scripture when they spoke, right? They had authority. Okay, so getting caught up in the counsel of God is going to shift your perception. It's going to take you to a place that you want to go, but you can't go without him taking you there. And this is what's happened in the last couple of years. It should have been happening all along because if, if think about it, after 2,000 years, you'd think we'd be doing better than the apostles were. 3,000 people, you know, formed the church in just a couple of days. But they believed in the good news. And they, they died for it. So I don't mind dying for Jesus Christ. But I'm not going to die, die of some foul devil's disease or a drunk driver. And I'm not going to let somebody abort me in my mother's womb, even though I can't do that now anyway. But I mean, you know, in other words, I'm going to stand up for the, 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 ooh, man. Am I going to go to heaven right now? I'm going to stay out of that spot. All righty then. So this is the time, because I don't know when I'm going to be able to come back. They let me land at Boeing Field today. They might not the next time because I'm not going to take anything into my body that they don't even know what it does. I don't care what it is. It takes six years. Six years. If one person, I mean, look at the profiles. If one person passes away because of that trial, they have to throw the whole thing away. When, when you've heard that's being spoken. And I'm not even, you know, the head honcho. I'm not even an expert. I'm a pert. I'm like a little pert. I'm not even an expert. 
this is about this big. But I'm a flight attendant that prays in tongues, now a pilot that prays in tongues. Amen. And I can discern in my spirit if something's not right. It's like, but it's like, no, you know what? You take it, and I'm just going to wait. So how you feeling? You got it again? Wait a minute. So you want me to follow you? Think about it. I'm just asking you. I don't care if I have to fast for a month. Because Amazon won't take me. And let me buy something. Uh, I'm not getting my genetics marked up with a mark. That's right. I'm not getting my, my genetics marked. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. I'm going to back out of that cave. We still on? Did they take us off? No? Okay. All right. No, you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it. Because, you know, when Jesus spoke the truth, the only people that withstood him were the religious people. It was the religious people that came after him. You brood of vipers. He, Jesus said, who warned you the coming wrath? He said, you're children of the devil. You're just like your father, the devil. You lie, you cheat, you steal. And so the, the test, you know, you take a test and it's positive and sometimes it's like color coded or whatever, you know. You know, and you, you could see, okay, there's a test, it's positive or negative. Okay, Jesus gave us this test. He said, the thief comes. Now, he's talking about, G, the, he's, he's talking about the small g, right. Satan, the prince of the polity, the prince of the power of the air. He's saying, the thief, Satan, when he comes, he steals, he kills, and he destroys. Okay, so there's your test. If there's any stealing going on, killing or destroying, it's the devil. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. So there's the test. To know who is operating behind the scenes. I don't care if it's your grandmother or your mother. Or your dog. No, cats, you know, I believe it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it doesn't matter because Jesus, it didn't matter to Jesus. He's training these disciples up and all of a sudden, one of his favorites says something and he calls him Satan. And says, get behind me, Satan. And it's Peter. Like, Jesus, it's me. Yo, you all right? Getting low on sugar? What, you need some sugar? You in a bad mood today? It's me, Peter. He goes... He, what, he, what he said was of man and not of God. That's what he said. He said, you have the things of man in mind and not the things of God. But he called him Satan. He didn't call him Peter that had a devil problem. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't uh, address it like how we take care of it. He called the person Satan because he was talking. Uh, he was a puppet and he was a Christian. I was in the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. That's the inner circle. John was the circle. Jesus was the only one. And it says that John said, I don't, you know, Jesus didn't commit himself to any man because he knew what it was in a man. He knew they were crazy. He knew that they would throw him under the bus. That's what it says. He knew what was in a man. He knew there, that they would sell him out. And, and this is what I was told when I went to heaven. Everybody has a, you know, I've never shared this before. And I know there's people watching. I don't care. But I was told, when it comes down to it, everyone will sell me out. There'll be a breaking point where they will want to preserve their life first before they preserve mine. There was only one that stuck closer than a brother, one who would die for you. And that was Jesus. He stuck it out, but he was sold out. They denied him. They all ran they did not want anyone to know that he, they were with him. Everything was fine when the miracles were flying and fish and bread were flying. Yeah. And where Jesus was honoring them. But then the minute that he needed them, he was not, they were not there. Why? Because everybody has a sellout point. Everybody has a point where they will preserve their own life. It's true. It's just the way we are. Okay, now, it, just, just, a, just a block from here at the Space Needle, 
I proposed to my wife. I took her out on our first date 28 years ago. And, and I told her, now based on what she had gone through, she, I don't know how she'd ever want to get married again. On what she went through. But I sat there on our first date in that space needle. And I said, I would die for you. We both started crying and we fell under the power of God and we never did eat. We never did eat. And we got married four months later and we've been married for 20, over 28 years now. The, but I, I, would die, I would die for her. I would die for her. And I couldn't do anything that I'm doing anymore without her. And every, every day when we add staff on, it just is another barrier that I cannot go back now and do it myself. There's no way that I could go any further and unless who is with me has my vision and does the heart of the Lord, not their own, and isn't in it for the wrong reason, then I can keep expanding out and, and reaching people. But if they would stop or if someone would mess it up, then I would have to retrench because I'm going further than I can do it on my own. Yeah. You get it, right? Yeah. Okay, so that, that's, I said all this is because I wanted to show you how much of, a, of, of God you need in your life. You have to be able to grab a hold of him and be determined that even if he tries to get rid of you, like, like Elijah did to Elisha, you know, he told him, he said, if you're with me when I'm taken, he said, you're going to have what you asked for, but it's a very hard thing. See, what people don't know, that what was so hard about what Elisha asked for was he wasn't asking for uh, uh, his, a double portion of his mantle, of Elijah's mantle. It doesn't say that. It says, I want a double portion of his spirit of the person's spirit. Well, that is walking in the power of God that his spirit was saturated. It's not the mantle he was wearing. It was, uh, it was Elijah's spirit. It says that. Get, get over it. Okay, so Elisha got a double portion, but it says that's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to transfer what's in a person's spirit to another person and then double it. Because everything that we encounter a lot of times, until recently, is giftings. These are deposits that are given by the Holy Spirit, and they're severally as He wills, it says, Paul says, the, the gifts are given, nine of them. Impartations given severally as He wills, not as you will. And then the fivefold ministry of the church, which, which everyone that is in that fivefold was set by God. It says God sets in the church some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. But you know, the the teachers, the teachers are accountable, it says, even greater because they're teachers. So if you teach, you're actually held at a higher accountability according to Paul. And you can go through that with all of them. And because people misunderstand the New Testament way of doing things, because they don't read the Apostle Paul. And Paul explains all this stuff. So you're going to always prophesy. You're going to always speak what God is saying. But how much of that that he is saying do people do? How much of that really happens? If you notice, God is speaking all these good things. But he did that through Jeremiah. He told, he told the people in Jeremiah, Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah prophesied, and in, in, in he started in verse 1 of chapter 29, talking about, Israel's captivity that was going to happen, that they were going to be taken to Babylon. And that after 70 years of captivity, they would cry out to him and he would hear them. And he would come and take them back into the land and that he had a good and expected end for them. This is 29, verse 29. Or, excuse me, verse 11 of 29. Good expected end. But see, the first verse, you've got to read all those verses up to 10. And then you get the one you quote all the time. I, gotta, I have plans for you. Good and perfect. Right, right. Expected end. Plans for you to prosper. Can you believe that that's in the Bible? Amen. That word prosper? Yes. Because that's what God, God you know, he, he didn't say, oh, you know, I have plans for you to fail and plans for you to be poor. No, it's never like that because in the old covenant, it was never that way. Only if you're disobedient, it's a fast way to get poor. Best way to get sick. Get out of the will of God by being disobedient. I mean, if you want to bring the Bible into it. 
And then Jesus said in John 15, the exact same wording is in Deuteronomy 28. He says exactly why. Because he read Deuteronomy 28. He, Jesus said, he said, if you love the Lord your God, you will obey his commands. And these, this day, if you choose, you're going to serve him and obey him. These things are going to happen to you. You're going to have all these blessings. It's this whole long you know, list of good things. But he said, if you choose not to, this is all the bad things that are going to happen to you. This is the God of Israel. This is how God revealed himself. So in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, and now I'm, I'm, I'm getting you ready to get caught up in the counsel of God, but I'm, I'm counseling you now because you got to get downsized so you can fit through the narrow way. Because you, you might be a little bit too, uh, you know, especially up in the head area, <laughs> you, you might not be able to fit through the narrow way. It's kind of skinny at the top. Your head is getting in the way because the Chinese news network has been, has been giving you all this foul lying stuff. ZNN. And the advertisements that are, that are on all of the programming is designed to put you in a certain direction. All the sitcoms are, are, are designed to undermine Everything that God represents, but you don't you might not know it, but if I said it you'd be offended But at least you would have heard the truth, but see it doesn't take it doesn't take very long to figure this stuff out And I'm sure you all know this But in the New Testament Paul said that I would rather out of all the gifts that you would desire the greater gifts the better gifts are like the gift to prophesy. He said, I wish you all would prophesy. Desire the greater gifts, like to prophesy. Why? Because that gift, when it, it's a vocal gift, and like right now, I'm prophesying. And I, every time you see me speak, I'm prophesying. I am. I am speaking from my spirit. I'm always speaking from down here, speaking it forth. And every now and then I'll interject something that makes you laugh because I need to loosen you up because I'm, I'm about to go in again. So I just give you a little rest. Your spirit is starving for the truth. Okay? All right, so when it is filled, your job is to prophesy it. Your job is to speak it forth. And I am not kidding you. And don't wait for God to print out your certificate to be a prophet. Don't even wait for that. I mean, if at least if you're going to print it out, get some of that nice paper. It's a little bow and a little seal down there, you know, number one, you know, number one prophet. No, don't wait until you complete the course online and then get your certificate. No, I guarantee you, 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 I mean, I, I, you do what you want, but you, if you go on the flight simulator and you fly the flight simulator there from Microsoft and then you go through all the things and it actually prints out a little certificate for you. Well, don't come to me and ask to fly my jet because you, you ain't going to do it. <laughs> so neither are you going to be one of the five-fold ministries of the church just because you print out a certificate or you take a course. No, God sets, this, sets you in the church some to be, not all. And I don't know anybody that's a five-fold minister of the church that actually wants to be at all because the price is, 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 is too high. It's getting higher every day. But see, it's always been that way in other countries. And I knew that the Antichrist spirit was rising up because, you know, toward the end, I was going to Australia and, and all, the, all the European countries in South Africa. And I noticed toward the end when I was going through customs and I, was, I had the high, one of the highest security clearances because I, I had background checks done because we were at the airline. So I had global entry and all that stuff and so I just had my, my fingerprint scanned and my retina scanned and you know, my big toe, whatever they wanted. I just gave it to them, you know, just scan it, let's get on with this. Just don't let me stand for two hours to come into a country that, that you know, I'm just sent there. I don't plan on living there. 
I don't plan on taking any of your money. I plan on giving. But at the end, I started to notice that even with, you know, because they can look at the computer, they see a, a high security clearance that I've been with an airline for 30 years. I have the highest, I don't even have to go through security. Right. I'm a known crew member. But then all of a sudden, at the end, I started to feel it a little bit as I w it would go through. And then there'd be this, this second round of questioning. There'd be going, especially going into Canada. I noticed, like, they're asking me, okay, what, did you, what do you do? Well, they're looking at my rap sheet for the last 35 years. And they know that I'm the, I have a high security clinic. They know, that, they know all, that I've been with Southwest Airlines. They know exactly. So I just tell them. I'm retired, but I used to be with Southwest Airlines, and I'm an author. And, it, it, and you could feel like, what is going on here? And the same thing happened in Europe at the end there in Germany, and, and Switzerland too. And it was, it was bizarre, like, y'all, I just want some chocolate, you know? Can I have some Swiss chocolate and I'll go, you know? Anyway, you know, you, you, you could feel something was going on, and then the Lord, Lord said to me, you're not, going to, you know, on the, you know, you're not going on the foreign field anymore. And I'm like, what? He says, no, everything next year will be canceled. And so I actually canceled it ahead of time. And then everything happened. And then the Lord said, you know, you're not going to need what you think you're going to need. You just need, you need transportation across the United States for a while. So we got the jet that we did. Amen. We could just make it across the United States, uh, you know, Still passes southwest, so we're good. <laughs> but the, the, the spirit of this world is, has risen up. However, what I have not seen is the spirit of God rising up in the church. Like we should. Like this room should be full. Not because it's me, but because the good news is being preached. And that I'm, I'm building up the body. That's all I'm assigned to do. I am assigned to build you up in the maturity and unity. That's what Paul told me to do in Ephesians chapter 11, 4, verse 11. He wrote me a letter. Apostle Paul wrote me a letter. And in the fourth chapter, verse 11, he told me that the fivefold ministry of church is called to build up the body. That's what we're supposed to do. There's no, there's no criticizing listed there. There's no judgment missing in there. I don't prophesy nation's doom. I'm not called to prophesy that kind of thing. I'm called to speak the truth in love. Well, the truth in love is, is that what God wants in a government is so pretty obvious based on if you read the Old Testament and you see all the numbskulls to where Samuel had to go out and get a shepherd boy. It took 17 years for him to be placed in that throne after he was anointed. And he had to take out the giants for the army of Israel because they could. And it was a boy. And he had Happy Meals with him. And he was just taking them to the battle line for his brothers. Happy Meals. It's back when Big Macs were a dollar. <laughs> That's over forever. And it's not real meat anyway, so why would you even pay for it? So anyway. Getting back to my story is, is that the, the demonic rose up yeah. against Israel and it took one person who was not educated in the system of the day. Right. He was not influenced by it because he was out with sheep. Yes. And he was, he was target practicing constantly. So he was he's sitting there picking up rocks and picking targets and hitting them. And he did that day after day. And now he couldn't afford it because ammo is so expensive. But back then, he sat there and target practiced. And then he had a harp. And he didn't even have six strings like you guys do on your guitars. He had, he had four. But yet he played all the time. For 17 years, he was anointed as king. Now, everybody listen to this. And the devil rose up, and no one could take care of the giant, those hybrids. So David, by default, not even by invitation, he was made to leave the sheep and go and, and to the battle line to feed his brothers. But the brothers weren't doing anything. So let them get their own food, you know? 
And David couldn't believe it. See, and this is what happens when you get caught up in the counsel of God. You, you can't believe that nothing is being done about uh, injustice. Why aren't people praying for people? Why are we having healing lines? You know, why aren't we praying for, for, for sick people? Why are we breaking the power of, that, of disease? Well, you know, the, you know, the disease has always been around. It just has a new name. Next week, it's going to be Foxtrot. It's, it's, it's Delta. It's going to be Echo, Foxtrot. And then they're going to go to some other animal because they've got to weaponize it. They've got to get the, the DNA from an animal, and they've got to give it to them because a human being is resistant to all this stuff. When are you people going to figure this out? Do you, hey, do, I, mean, I, I mean, I paid attention in biology, and I don't even have a doctorate in it. But everybody knows that you got to, in order to weaponize it, you've got to get it, somebody to get, to take it within the blood. You've got to get someone or something, like Fluffy, the animal, so that it has to mutate to the place where you can give it to a human. This is like your first day in biology. So it's weaponized. Because human beings, it's hard to kill a human being. Because they're made in the image of God. Yeah. They, they keep living. They fight cancer. Right. They stand up and they think, you know, no, I'm not going to die. I'm not going to die. I'm going to live. And they fight. They fight. Why do you go to the doctor? Because you want to live. So David came in from the outside, was not caught up in the drama, was not brainwashed, did not watch ZNN, did not get the, you know, the, the briefing from the, the White House lawn or the Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer. He had nothing. He has nothing. Bah, that's all he hears. Bah. Feed me. Feed me. Give me water. And he, he comes into this and he cannot believe that Israel is allowing this giant to stand up and profane, profane God. Profane the name of God. He was calling down curses on God and Israel. How dare this uncircumcised Philistine defy the armies of the living God. Okay, well, you have to understand that when he said that, he wasn't just looking ahead at his numbskull brothers. He was looking at the armies of Israel, the angelic armies, that were behind waiting for some human being because a human being has the authority on the earth. Jesus gave us the authority. As human beings, we have the authority. It's been stolen because of Satan. So if you notice, it all works through... It all works towards dictatorship. But it comes as like, don't you know? That if you eat of this, you're going to be like God. Well, they already were like God. Adam and Eve knew more than that, that being did. Because God came down every day and talked with them. So the conversation should have ended very quickly, and it didn't. And so it just got worse because all of a sudden, Eve started to doubt what she already knew. And she could have waited until the afternoon when God came down in the cool of the day to talk with them. If he, she had any questions, she could have just asked, you see, so there's something, there's a weakness in us, even in our perfected state, where we feel disconnected. So this is what has happened. We're disconnected. Why? Because we've let the war get into us. We're sent into the war, but we're not supposed to get the war in us. We're, not, we're ineffective and compromised if we allow the war to get into us. David didn't let the war get into him. He went in there and he had solutions for everything. And he goes, you know what, I'll just take care of it. And they're like looking at him. And he's not even, you know, doesn't have a driver's license yet. And he's like, you know, well, do you have any weapons, you know? He's already like, you know, no, nah, it's just it's too bulky. Well, who's your dad? So the, the servants of the king, Saul, they went and said, Saul said, find out who his dad is. Find out what his intentions are. Those two things is what the king asked. So why would he ask that? Because it was all about lineage. It was all about who you were connected to. 
he wanted to know who his, his lineage was, his dad. Was well, Jesse. Okay, so what's your intention? I just want to take this giant out and then I'll be on my way. Just like that. Not a, a kid. Barely out of his training wheels. And yet he, he, he has more sense, spiritual sense. Why? Because he spent time out there and was caught up in the counsel of God because the anointing that was placed on him was his future. The anointing was from the future and it was speaking on behalf of him even as he grew into it for 17 years. He was encountering the kingship for 17 years but not having a throne. It was starting to come into him. The anointing was starting to work through him. And he realized that this is why I was born. This is why I am here at this time. I am to be the king of Israel. But it was at a really bad time. And this happens in every generation. Why does it take a flight attendant to tell you this? Why does it take a hairdresser and a flight attendant? It shouldn't, but that's what's necessary at the time. This is not the end. Because this happens in every generation. Just open your textbooks. Well, get the ones that they haven't erased stuff from. But, but your plan, the purposes and plans that God had for you were written before you were born. In fact, the, according to Scripture, it, may, it would take a week, but I could pull out all this Scripture and, you know, just read Paul for a week. Then I won't have to teach for a week. But he said that all the good works that we were going to do in Christ were already preordained. Predestined is a word. This isn't Calvinism, where you, some are ordained to go to heaven and some are going, going to hell. This is predestination because of God's foreknowledge. He writes out your book before you're born. And he had it all planned as though you're going to accept him. But very few people accept him. If you want to count the, the almost 8 million, billion people in the world, very few people believe. Very few people would find the narrow way out of that. But I'm, not, I'm, I'm going after the remnant right now because then the remnant will go after the lost. Yes. Amen. Yes. But it's going to be because God's going to show himself through you and glorify himself through you. Yes. Okay? All right. So the... The encounter that David was having all those days was the anointing was working as though he was king. And he found himself doing things that were later very valuable, right? So he didn't need the, he didn't need the armor that Saul gave him. That has to do with the religious system. It has to do with the status quo of like how we say, well, this is how we take care of this. Well, that's not going to happen anymore. If something doesn't work, do you wait till it kills you to decide this isn't working? Or do you take your exit point? Do you have an egress? Do you have a way of escape? Because God said to, through Paul, in Corinthians, he says that God always pro provides a way of escape so that you can bear up under it in any temptation. There's no temptation that has taken you except what is common to man. But God has provided a way of escape. So that means he has an exit point and egress for everything. Now, Paul is a great man of faith. So obviously, this isn't a lack of faith that he's saying this about. This is wisdom to show you that you find yourself in tight situations and, and God knows that you're in that situation and he knows that you can only bear so much. But he obviously trusted David or did he trust what he did for David by anointing him? Did he, was he really trusting David or was he trusting the anointing that was poured on him? The, or, the ordination to be king, which was already predetermined. Paul was Saul. He killed Christians. When he was about 30, he got demasked on the road to Damascus. Because <laughs> he had a sight problem. But this is what he told the churches after he had killed Stephen, 
all these other things that happen. He said, I've wronged no man. He would say that in his letters. He said, in fact, I was appointed, I was appointed as an apostle since birth. And Stephen's like, excuse me. Right? So obviously God's will is not always done correctly or exactly. But it eventually works out. And David had to wait 17 years. I don't believe that he should have had to. But he did, okay? God didn't even want Saul. He didn't want a king. God said, I want to be your king. Remember, he didn't even want, uh, want Saul to begin with. I don't know if you remember that, but the whole thing was, he wanted all of Israel to come up on the mountain and have a party and, and be with them and, and dwell with them. And they wouldn't have it, right? Okay. So back to David. David was offered what was available to fight the giants, which wasn't working. So that's the religious system. And that's broken government too. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about the body of Christ, the church. Okay, so resurrection power wants to give you life, which is dwelling in you, according to Paul, if you want to bring him into it. It's, it's dwelling in you. The same power rose Jesus from the dead. In, in Romans 8, it talks about this. You have a spirit of adoption inside of you. You literally are adopted into the Father, into the family. You have his name. You literally have the spirit of adoption in you. You're, you literally have everything that God has, which will get you kicked out of churches for saying that. That's why I, I go to hotels. <laughs> because Peter said you could be a partaker of the divine nature. You could be a partaker of the divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world caused by ZNN. No, caused by lust. <laughs> Peter said this in 2 Peter chapter 1. So I'm a partaker of the divine nature? Well, that, that, well am I made in the image of God? Well, that, that means that if you take a picture of me and you take a picture of God, well, what is an image? Man, you're an exact image of your brother. What does that mean? You look just like your brother. You look like your dad. Well, what does that mean? Well, don't, you don't have to do a word study. An image is a copy of the original. And when you take the original and you put a copy down, you can tell the difference, but it's not that easy. You have to kind of look really close. See, this will get you kicked out of churches. But this was the plan that Jesus Christ and the Father had from the beginning, to buy us back to where we were before the fall. That's, that's why. Now listen to me. David knew the covenant. Because he stated it. He said, uncircumcised Philistine. How dare this uncircumcised Philistine defy the armies of the living God? When you said that, uncircumcised, that was the sign of the covenant. That was Israel's way of determining that you were in covenant with your God. It's just the way it was. I, I wouldn't have chose that. I would have just, you know, had an ID card, you know. Just back off, buddy. I'm good. Just, I have my ID. That's all I need. I'm a child of God. But... That is what David was saying. Think about it. When he said that, how dare you defy, you uncircumcised Philistine. Today, I'm going to make you, I'm going to feed you the birds. I'm going to make you bird feed. That's what he said. Cocky little kid? No. He was the only one that was caught up in the counsel of God. He had inside information because he discerned the covenant. But look what was happening. Israel is about to get wiped off the map. But see, that can't happen because God had already said, these people are my people and that's the way it's going to be. You don't touch them. You touch them, you touch me. Right? Okay, so David came at the giant with the covenant. And that's what I want to show you is, is that today, the, the way things used to work, well, you know, where, where they argue about sprinkling or dunking or immersing or tongues or no tongues, they're arguing about stuff that has already been shown and given to us in the New Testament. So the old does not work because the new is that the Spirit has been poured out on all flesh. Sons and daughters are going to prophesy, so it's too late. 
it's too late to say that that isn't going to happen. So David, just like the church should be saying, should be speaking the covenant, should be falling back on the covenant. Because God is greater, and when you make a covenant with someone, you make sure that you're coveting, coveting up. That it's more to your benefit than theirs. You find someone that's bigger, better, and you covenant with them. You get it? And you latch on. So I chose to latch on to Jesus Christ and literally handcuff myself to him and then throw the key away. And now he's stuck with me, but he's really not. He kind of likes it. Because he likes it because he likes you. He loves you. But you, you, you latch yourself to him. And then it appears, it's because of our poverty mentality, the way we think we're invaluable or, just, or, or unvaluable. But we are, we are very valuable. But we're, we think of ourselves as not being very valuable. So we think, well, you know, I'm just going to bother God by praying. And asking it for something, because I'm just going to bother. Sorry to bother you, but you know what? I, I have no food for, to eat, you know, or something like that. And you feel like you're bothering God. But see, he likes that. He likes to be needed. But see, we, we think, well, well, I'll just chain myself to him, and then he's got to drag me around. <laughs> right? But see, that's because of our mental. Our, we, we, no, we can, we can go into the Holy of Holies unannounced. It, it's been made. It's made. It's been a new and living way has been made. We can walk right in. And just like little JFK Jr. under his dad's desk playing with his fire truck, under the presidential de desk. This is back when they had real presidents, you know. And they, he, he didn't have to ask permission. And so David didn't have to ask permission to defend his God because he was in covenant with God and he understood that he had coveted up. So he knew you know what, I'm going to stick up for God and there's no way he's going to let me fail. Because I'm just defending what God said and I already know what he said and I know that Israel's not going to get off the, wiped off the face of the map. That this land is his and, you know, etc. So he, he came at him with the covenant. You got it? Yeah. So you got it all, okay? Yeah. So... What else did he come at him with? With what he was familiar with, what he had been trained on, what he felt comfortable with, which is why not every one of us is doctors or nurses or, uh, you know, or plumbers, you know, or electricians. You know, we need everyone to be who they are because we need all, everybody. And I don't want to touch electricity. Uh, there's two things I don't do. It's plumbing and electricity. You know, I, I, I don't go into that arena because... You know, the odds are against me. <laughs> and I don't, I don't, I don't claim to, to know something I don't understand. I, I turn myself in and let somebody better do it. I'm, I'm, I'm fully fine with that. And you should be too. But when you're caught up in the counsel of God, you know, you know your track. You know what you're trained in. And you do that. And you're good at that. And so he used the sling because that was comfortable to him. And he could do that upside down in a hailstorm with people throwing eggs at him. He could do it. And he could play that harp. Okay, so he went after that giant that day. And it was interesting because I, I did a lot of study, did, did years and years of study, and I don't know if I'll ever get to the bottom of, of what I've read to tell people, but the genetic flaw... The genetic flaw in those hybrids, I guess there was a, a thinner, thinner membrane in their forehead. And so when that rock hit, that's where it could penetrate, where, you know, it, it would be impossible to kill one of those things. But for some reason, between the eyes there, that forehead, there was, a, there was, a, there was a, some sort of fragile spot there. And, you know, you can read this stuff, and, you know, of course, I'm not a scientist and don't want to be. I don't want to be a doctor either. <laughs> but I, I, need, I need somebody that's, that knows that stuff. But, you know, anyway, I'm going to back out of that cave. <laughs> All right, so David took him out. He took him out because he knew he could take him out. That's right. 
But he took him out with, with what God had trained him on, and he was, his strength was really not his slingshot. It was his co- the, the knowledge of the covenant that he came from the outside. So this is why it's very important for you to allow the Holy Spirit to catch you up in his counsel and get you out of the environment that's hostile because the war will eventually get into you if it already has it. And then your health is going to be affected. Your ways of thinking are going to be affected. And you're going to miss opportunities when angels have set you up for your provision and for your ministry and for your, your family members to be saved and healed. To, for people to experience healing, you've got to be synchronized with heaven so that you can sense the Spirit of God moving in healing or deliverance, and you can know if it's a devil or if it's just organic and that people need healing. But you're going to have to speak the good news. Even, even if you doubt it, you've got to tell people the good news of the gospel. If you're sick, you preach healing anyway. Amen. It doesn't matter. Okay, because it's God that's doing the healing, and if he doesn't show up, we're all in trouble anyway. Okay, so David did not allow the war to get into him because it didn't have time to get into him. Because he was just tending sheep. He was doing what he does. But he had that anointing. Now, see, God has anointed us, each one of us. You know, you're, you know, when, you know, I, I don't, okay. When I met Jesus, he didn't ask me if his robe made him look fat. <laughs> he didn't ask me, you know, I've been thinking about just doing my hair on the side. Instead of in the center, you know, what do you think? Should I just use a ponytail? Should I get it cut short? He had a command about him. And he was, he was the most amazing person I've ever met. But he was my God, too. But he was my friend. But he was amazing. And I thought to myself, I would never want to find myself on the wrong side of him. Even as a son, even as a brother, even as a friend of God, I never wanted to cross him because there's something about him that I just don't want, I don't want to be on the wrong side of the tracks. I don't want to be in his way because there's something about him where he, when he wants something, he, he seems to do everything he can to get it. And even if he has to, send a flight attendant back from the dead to do it, he will do it because he loves people. It's not because of me, because I don't even want to be here. I mean, if you went to heaven, you'd be saying the same thing. You're looking at me like, you have no, well, you know, obviously, and now we're waiting for a white horse to come back to rescue us from all this. But see, what if the white horse can't come back until we do something? Because that is a truth. And so at the end of this age, when things are wrapping up, it's supposed to be fireworks time. It's supposed to be a glorious time where there's a harvest that comes in. And the people that are watching, they're, they're looking for God in us. They're not looking at you. They're going to criticize you. People are going to want to kill you. They want to get rid of you. But what they really want is they want to see God displayed in a person's life. They want to see that a person could walk away from being a fighter pilot. And 41 years later, on Monday, I get to fly a fighter jet. Monday, I go to training. Amen. Okay? And I walked away from all this. And today, I flew with Tom, my other pilot. I flew in my own airplane. But I walked away from it and didn't care if it ever came back. But see... That to the world is like, I want to know about your God. Because he didn't forget what you, he, he didn't forget you. Right? Yeah. Well, let's be honest. Okay, so that's what people are looking for. They're looking to see if God is actively in your life manifesting in some way. Which means that you're going to have at least, at the very least, you're going to have Deuteronomy 28. I mean, even the Old Testament it's pretty crazy, isn't it? That the Old Testament covenant is looking pretty good right now. All those goodies you get. 
What about Psalms 91? If you make the most high your dwelling place, not a visitation drive through window, a dwelling place. If you make the most high your dwelling place, all these things are going to happen to you. He, and he says, not even a disease is going to come near you. Amen. You'll see a thousand fall, 10,000 at your right hand, but it won't come near you. It says that if you make the most high your dwelling place. So to me, is it's just it's simple math. If these things are coming near me and they're doing something to me, then it means I didn't make the most high my dwelling place. Because it says, if you make the most high, it says in Deuteronomy 28, if you love the Lord your God and you obey my commands. It's the exact wording that Jesus said in John 15 and in 14. If you don't like John 15, just go to John 14. It says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. He says, even me and my father uh, love you. But he says, my father loves you and he will come, me and him will come. And it literally says, in Aramaic or in Greek, it says, we will come in and bring our furniture with us and move in. We will move in with, and we'll bring our furniture. Well, that's the Father and the Son. Well, Jesus already said that when he returns to the Father, the Spirit's going to come and never leave you. Be with you forever. Okay, that... That, that is the Trinity. That's three people. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit inside of you. Okay? David hooked up with this in the Old Testament. He didn't even have Bethel music or his iPad. The nearly inspired version wasn't even written yet. The NIV. You know, the nearly inspired version. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's a very mysterious translation because weekly, really good scriptures just disappear out of it. And if you let them keep refreshing you every week with a new, a new update, they're taking scripture out. Yes. I had to stop the updates to my Bible software. Am I right? Moving on. So let's learn from history. David did something smart. He did what he was doing. He did his stuff. It was insignificant to everybody. He didn't make it into the army. But he was anointed as king. But he, he didn't even get chosen to go, go to war. So he's, doing, he's running an errand, and he comes into this, and he sees that the covenant is being violated, right? Because that's what he said. He came at the giant saying, you uncircumcised Philistine, noting that, he, that he's violating the covenant. He's not, he's not circumcised like Israel is. And he defeated the giant with a kid's toy, but really in that day it was a weapon. Okay, he used, symbolically, he used the sword of the giant to cut his own head off because that's what we do. The enemy was destroyed by Jesus Christ. He made a fool out of him openly, triumphing over the cross. It says that he destroyed, that he, that he destroyed the works of the devil. He destroyed them, it says. Okay. The enemy is, is, is being hung by his own rope. But you have to wait for that to happen. Herod was a wicked king, but Jesus still could heal while he was president. <laughs> yeah. When Herod would show up, he'd just go somewhere else. So the body is supposed to manifest the covenant. 
And the gifts of the Spirit that have been given are supposed to be used. So David, later, after he killed the giant, Saul had some devil problems. And one of the servants said, listen, I know of a, of a, a boy that can play the harp. Would you, would you want me to go get him? Make you feel better. They said, yeah, well, when David would play that harp, the demons would leave. When Jimi Hendrix played his guitar, devils came. <laughs> it didn't matter how good he was. Did devils come or did devils go? When, when you use your gift, do devils come or do they go? You see, when you speak, do devils flee? Do they know you're speaking by the Spirit? Do, do, when you start talking about the covenant that you have with God and that the blood is enough to cleanse you of your past, so I don't know why you're bringing up all those fake photos because your past is gone. It doesn't even exist in heaven. I mean, you know, I was there. There's no files in heaven for any of us. They're, they're gone. Jesus doesn't have access to the files because they do not exist. He had no account of me ever sinning. He talked to me as though I had never sinned. He talked to me like we were commanders together. We're, I, was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was actually, can you believe it, a co-heir? Joint heirs with Jesus Christ, an heir of God. And can you believe that the Bible is actually true? And he was talking to me, not down to me. He was talking to me as though me and him were in partnership. And then I realized maybe I should come back. Because people need to know this, that the Bible is absolutely true. But it's so potent that it really is hard to water it down, but it's been done. But it's, in its, it's so potent that it's too good to be true. But see, that's what the gospel means. It's too good to be true. It's such a good news. God is so good that you can hardly even believe it. But you better. It's not hard to believe God when you're in the throne room. It's not hard when an angel comes and visits you in your bedroom. But it is hard when your husband is gone and you're looking at a tree and a serpent comes and says, don't you know that God's holding something back from you? That's when it's hard. It, it, it's, it's when you're getting rug, you know, getting carpet time because the power of God's so strong. When you can't speak in English, all you can do is speak in tongues. And you think, when you get healed, and you literally are healed, and you want to tell everybody, and, and you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, when you have miracles happen, but when the enemy retaliates, do you say, how dare you come against a child of God who is under covenant? Do you know what you've just done? You just touched God. What did Jesus say? Why are you persecuting me, Saul? He goes, when have I persecuted you, Jesus? He goes, when you touched all my, any of my children, any of my little ones, you've done it unto me. I know, I know this. I know that if anybody does anything to me, anything, it would be better for them to have a millstone tied around their neck and be cast to see than to touch one of these little ones. I'm his little one. I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm a big one. I'm a little one because that's, that's where you see God step in as if you're like th this big and you need help. I just want to stay a child. I know that if somebody does something against me, especially Christians, I know that, that I don't even want to be around during that court case. Because you can't come against your own flesh and blood, but you can't come against those who are redeemed. You can't fight each other. It's, it's a terrible sin for a Christian to come against a Christian. It's terrible. It's embarrassing in the army of God because that you just don't hear of that. They're, everybody's a friend in the trenches. When you're in war, all you want to do is get out so you help each other, even if you don't like the hat they're wearing. 
or their jeans have holes in them, you know? So when an angel shows up and gives you the word of the Lord, and you have an encounter with Jesus to where you, you can't stand it, and I've asked him, can I just go with you? Can I just go with you? And yet, you find yourself here the next day, and then you got the disease of the week. You've got all the different things that could happen. It's all these variables. And, and when do you just stand back and say, you know what? This is too big for me. I'm just going to fall back on the covenant. That's right. You see, the answer, the answer has already been given to you in the Word of God. There, everything that you need to know is in there. And what is that, that, that verse in Daniel, the two, the, the chapter 2, verse 34, right? Is that it? 43. 43. Just, just not dyslexic, but... But Daniel had a vision. It's, and it's interesting, the Hebrew language was the language of the day. So Daniel's writing in Hebrew, but when he gets to verse 4 of chapter 2, he, he slips over into Aramaic. He goes the whole way through up into chapter 7 in Aramaic and then goes back and finishes the rest of his book in Hebrew again. But no explanation for it. What happens during that time, though, is he's talking about the future and he's talking about all the kingdoms because he had to interpret that dream. But it wasn't enough to interpret it. He had to tell the dream what it was to, to the king and then interpret it. So he talks about the gold head and it goes the whole way down to the ten toes in there. And at the end, is, is that right, 43? Yeah. Okay. Um, at the end of time, it says, the last kingdom on the earth will have ten toes. It will be ten toes. So it will be ten sectors. And it, it just keeps degrading from gold the whole way down to the toes are actually clay, miry clay which is very important, and iron. And it says this, and they tried to mingle with the seed of man, and it would not take. Okay, so having a degree in journalism, I know that if there's a they, I have to go back to where they refer to the proper noun because once you mention the person or the thing and you identify it, you can later refer to it with a pronoun. But you're not allowed to do that unless you've already mentioned the full name or the full description of it. Well, if you, you, try, you try to find it, I, I dare you. There is no mention of the noun, who they is. But obviously they try to mingle with the seed, which is the genetics. The seed is your offspring. It's the same word as talked about when God said the seed of the serpent. The offspring of the serpent. The serpent has children. Get over it. I hope you're not one of them. And I believe you're not. But it says that that will fight the seed of the woman. But the woman doesn't have seed. They have eggs. Okay? But that's too long of a course. But I want to tell you something now. Why, are, why did they, at the end of the age, try to mingle with the seed of men, but it would not take? In other words, they could not interbreed. It wouldn't take. Well, what did Jesus say? What, you already know my stand on what happened in Noah's day. He, 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 Noah was the only one that was still perfect in his genetics. It says it was perfect in his generations. Only eight people. There was nobody else. Barney the dinosaur died too. There was no dinosaurs on the ark. That is part of the hybrids. It's part of the reptilian. It's part of getting back on their feet when God had taken away their legs. Come on now. All right, so you have these disembodied spirits. Because they weren't fully human. They, they have no resurrection. What do you think? The, the one giant race, Raphaim. Look it up. It means no resurrection. Their actual name means no resurrection. They have no repentance. These, that's why these demons are so upset. They're disembodied. You're in and they're out. 
and they, they don't care. They just want to destroy you. If they can't play, then they don't want you to play either. They don't, they're, they're done. Are you coming to torment us before our time? Don't send us out of the area. You should, you should listen to these things. Okay? So, Jesus said, at the end of the age, before I come back, it will be just like in the days of Noah. Right? That's what he said. Well, what did he mean? Well, let's look like what it was in the days of Noah. Well, only eight people made it. And none of the animals did except the two, the, the two by two that were chosen that, that were, I believe were perfectly without blemish. Come on now. The, I mean, a kid, you know, Sunday school class can get this. They understand this. They did not take. They could not mingle with the seed of man. Well, if they couldn't, if they couldn't, single, couldn't mingle with the seed of man, then they weren't men. It wasn't man that was trying to mingle with them. Do you get that? This is what you do with scripture. It's all there. So the answer, I've known this answer for over 25 years, and it hasn't been until last month that I was allowed to release this verse. It's in Daniel. It explains what's going on here. So you need to guard your genetics. Because you're purely human. If you start to not be that way, you could get to the place where you're not eligible because Jesus came for a perfectly human being. He came as a perfect human. That's why all of those, all the genealogies are in the Bible to show that none of the, of the hybrid races got into his blood to marry. Does everybody understand that? Okay, so... David was anointed to take out those hybrids because it's all about the genetics. It's all about the bloodlines. Yeah. So you have to be caught up in the counsel of God. Because where this is going is, is they are going to offer you a chance to live, to be 100 and 200 years old. Without, you won't need health care. Because tortoises can live to be 200 years old. And they already have done this. They can take their DNA and put it into humans. They've already done this. So at what point do people say, well, yeah, I'll take that. Well, at what point do they say, well, if you don't, well, you know, because you're going through it now. This is just all a test. But, but when you're caught up in the counsel of God, you start to understand the times and the seasons. You have the anointing of Issachar. Issachar, the sons of Issachar, it says, had the anointing to know and interpret the times and the seasons of the Lord. Issachar is one of the 12 tribes. There are 12 stones in the breastplate. Issachar is there. I think it's interesting that the, 12, the nine stones that are mentioned in Lucifer's breastplate, and you just go ahead to Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, and you look up and you count and you match the Hebrew words up, the stone for Issachar is not in the breastplate of Lucifer, which means he doesn't understand the times and the seasons. There are only nine stones, and there are two others that maybe I'll start to share too. But I know his weaknesses. You see, part of, of a war is, is studying your enemy's weaknesses. And I, I, I study his weaknesses. See, he doesn't know the times and the seasons. He has to push the timeline to see where we are. So he, he lies and makes it look a certain way to see if he can push it. So what he does is if he senses that there is a deliverer that will eventually go to Mount Sinai and get the law, he's going to take that baby out. So he went after Moses because he thought he was the Messiah. He thought Abel was the Messiah because God had just told him that the seed of the woman is going to crush your head. So he automatically said, okay, well, Adam, Eve, Abel. So Cain is the problem. If you look at the gene genealogy of Cain, 
you will understand why the sons of God could not go into the daughters of Cain. The sons of God, the sons of Adam lived almost to Noah. And they had all these babies, but at a certain point, if you went down here, you could not, the sons of God could not go into the daughters of men. <laughs> why are you all looking at me like that? This is what's in the Bible. Hebrews says, when has God ever called an angel his son? So the angels can't be sons of God. It says that. He has never called an angel his son. Only Jesus is a son of God. And now it says we've been made children, not angels. Read it. Just read it. Read Psalms 8 because it quotes that in, in Hebrews. Hebrews, do you know that they don't even know who wrote Hebrews? It's a supernatural book. And, and Hebrews has pretty much all your questions answered. But how many people preach from that? Okay, getting back to David. So David eventually worked his way in, and his government was formed in a cave called Adalam, which means cave of justice or justice of God. And 400 people came that were busted, disgusted, and discouraged. It says those who were poor, discouraged, and disgusted came and met with David in that cave because he was hiding from Saul. Saul didn't like his plane. But see, the demon didn't like his plane. Saul wanted Jimmy Hedrick to play for him. But see, when David played, the anointing came through the harp. When he, threw, when he used the sling, the anointing from Samuel went through the sling and killed the giant. But David was the forerunner of the Messiah. That's why it says in Psalms 89 that there will never cease to be a person on your throne, David. He, the Messiah came through David. Why did they always cry out, Oh, son of David, have mercy on me. They were saying Messiah because they knew that it would come through David. Okay. So David was set up as king and then he automatically went out and started killing all the giants. And this is what we should be doing. Because he, he picked five smooth stones. Not because he was going to miss but you can find Goliath's relatives. He had three brothers and a father that are listed in the Bible. He didn't plan on missing. He planned on the whole family coming after him. So he chose five stones because there were five giants. Did you know that? See, this is the spirit of David. So don't you think the church should be at least that? You get it? Okay, so David had this about him because he was a giant killer. So as we go into these, these, these days ahead, you're going to start to see that people are being altered. But it might be against their knowledge. They might not even know. So you have to be wise on what you do. You have to pray and know. And, you, and I can't make those decisions for you. I can tell you what the Word of God says, but the counsel of God is for all of us. But we all have to stay in unity together. And the only way to do that is to preach good news. That God, God has a good plan for us. And that I want to be the generation that doesn't do what every other generation has done. And that is, is, is rebel, be stiff-necked, or, or resist the voice of the Lord when He speaks. You know, or fall away. Which is prophesied will happen in the end days. So I'm never going to back off on this message, but I'm encouraging you to flip your city. Yes. And how you flip it is you start praying in the spirit and you say things like, not on my watch, yeah. because I labored here for years. Yeah. I literally was told to move here and buy a house and live here and pray here in tongues, me and my wife, and we, we, it took, it, it's kind of embarrassing. But if a house isn't owned by us, if it's not something that was built from nothing, which we have done, 
When we built our house from nothing in the desert, in the desert, ours, nothing was there but tarantulas and scorpions. And we built that house. That house was so anointed. There was never a devil problem because we just built it and no one else lived in it. But the other houses that we've bought, other people lived in them. And it would take, listen to this, it would take, in, here in Seattle, we would come up here because we had two houses and I was working for Southwest out of Phoenix. So I would just jump on Alaska Airlines, show my ID and come up. And I would do that every week. But when we would get here, and then, then it got to where I would fly for two weeks and have two weeks off. And then I said, you know what, I just want to retire. Because you have to fly to work and then fly. And then after you're done flying, you have to fly back home. So you're always flying. Which is great for you all, but maybe after you did it for 30 years, it's not so, it's not so great. But now it's more fun when you have your own airplane. But we would come up here and we're like, okay, okay, we're going to go to Snoqualmie Falls. We're going you know, to go to the beach. You know, we're going to go see Shamu and... We're, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to go to Mount Rainier and play in the snow in July. We know we got all this up. We would get to our house and we would start praying in tongues. And before you know it, a week's gone and we got to start back to Phoenix. And I'm like, so this just kept on going. It went on for two and a half years where we literally all we did was go to prayer meetings and Bible studies and, and just pray with people. And then God said, it's time to move. So we moved back. We sold our, we sold our place up here. We sold our Phoenix house. And we moved to New Orleans which is not my idea. But that's what God wanted. But it took two and a half years, and Kathy and I are like, we would just laugh. We're like, you gotta be kidding me. The power of God would hit us as soon as we walk in our house up here. And in three days, it's like, it's like a puff of, it's, it's over. I gotta go back to work or, all we did was pray. We, we fasted two meals a day while we were up here. Sometimes we didn't eat at all for a couple days. And we, we couldn't get to the end of the intercession for, the, for this place. We couldn't get to the bottom of it. No matter what we did, no matter how many people we got to pray with us, it seemed like there was such a, a, a grip. But see, now, to me, it's open heaven here. Now you think, oh yeah, but you don't live here. It's like, yeah, but I did, and I did my homework. Now it's your turn. Because I blazed a trail. But see... Don't you think that King David blazed a trail? Because 30 fighting men, it says, could hit a target with a sling within a hair's breadth. Do you think how thin a hair is? And you think that that's how accurate they were doing this? And they could hit that target. So it wasn't just David's anointing that was doing that. He was practicing and he was able to transfer that to someone else, to 30 fighting men. Okay, so Goliath is taken out. And then all these other races, they get raised up. But we don't know where they came from. How did they pop up? And why were they waiting in the promised land? How did they know to go to the promised land because they weren't from there? Why did all the giants know to go to the Golan Heights and all these places and, and build their, 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 their fort, forts there? It was preemptive, knowing that Israel was coming, you know, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, then Moses with the people, and then Joshua went bang, 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 killed all the giants, and took them up into Jerusalem. It took hundreds and hundreds of years, but how did the devil know? Because God had said it. He talked about the land. He took, he took Abraham to the promised land and showed it to him. You know, when Joshua went there, that wasn't the first time they'd been there. Joshua spied out the land, but Abraham had been there. Jacob had been there. Think about it. So how did the giants know? It's because God had said it. So see, God has spoken over you. The devil knows about you because God has spoken over you. And then he sent Samuel to anoint you. He sent the Holy Spirit to anoint you for your calling. So you are effective and you're well equipped. You're well equipped. You really are. 
Now, angels that are here right now, right now, they're here. In fact, they've been here the whole time. They are standing here as the word of God is being spoken, waiting to see if any of you start to light up inside of you. Your spirit starts to respond by faith, hearing the word, and it creates a, a actual ignition inside your spirit that is visible. And angels are watching to see how your spirit is receiving the word. And they are hoping that there's enough there for you to actually do something, to manifest it. That your gift will start to want to move you in a certain direction. And so I always have a plan because the Holy Spirit is wanting to counsel us and give us a plan, an exit strategy so that we can bear up under it. And it's, it's not considered failure. See, I used to think if a righteous person that wanted to stick up for the people and would defend, um, defend uh, children and unborn children uh, to, to create a justice system where it wasn't crooked, and that people weren't bought, that they didn't have some uh, secret ring that I don't want to mention, and they're all part of that society. And then it doesn't matter who you were elected to be, you have to make decisions based on your secret society. Is that enough? Have I said enough? Okay, that's what happened. So you have all these people that turn their backs because it doesn't matter what color your state is. You're told this is what you're going to do because it's a you know, higher order. But see, a lot of people are in that. All right, so I always wonder, like, what would happen if someone would get into office and actually, and, you know, it was answered right away because I saw what happened to presidents that did this. And even Ronald Reagan got his warning shot, and he was told the next time you're dead. You look at the speeches that were given right before these things happened with, with, with JFK, what he was saying, and you look at the parallel, and that you're told, if you cross this line, and so is it really surprising to you that someone that actually was for the people, I mean, where's Martin Luther? He was for the people. Man, when he spoke, oh my gosh. I thought, this man has to be from God. But he had, he had that ability because he could, he could communicate. But what it was, he was speaking on behalf of the people. He was speaking truth. Okay? Well, where, where is he? So are you really surprised? Okay, so it's stolen from but is it, is it the end? No, it's not the end. Because God always reserves one more move for himself. Amen. So the longer it takes, the deeper the payback. Yes. Amen. Okay, because I already know, right, I know God's personality. He wants people to be saved. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. He's seeking those who are lost he doesn't desire that anyone should perish, but everyone should come to eternal life. Jesus told me that in person, in heaven. He told me the signs that when he would come. He, doesn't, he said, I don't know when I'm coming, but I can give you some hints. And those things are all in the scriptures, but those things have not happened yet. And what happens is, is if you look at the things that it says have to happen first, it all has to do with us. So if we're waiting on God, we're really wrong because he's waiting on us. Amen. He's given the Holy Spirit already. The Holy Spirit's not coming back again. Jesus is not coming back again. He died so that we could have everything that the gospel says we could have. Okay, so he's not going to come back and do an amendment to healing because obviously his blood wasn't enough because not everyone's being healed. That's not true. His blood is always enough. Every devil knows that. 
Okay, if that's the truth, if his blood is enough, then don't you think that maybe it's something that we need to move closer into and, and come let us reason together with the Lord and ask him to help us. So if I give up healing, I might make some people happy that I'm backing off on healing, but then they're going to want me to back off on deliverance. And they already want me to, to back off on, on prosperity, but they're the same people that want me to buy their lunch because they don't have any money. So I got to prosper for all my friends that don't believe in prosperity. Because they have alligator arms, you know, when the check comes. You know. They can't quite reach the check, you know. Alligator arms. Right? It's the same with healing. People want you to sympathize when they're sick. But the thing of it is, 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 is sympathy saying, okay, you know what? Maybe I should just not be so hard in my preaching and make, and make you feel better. You know, I'll just back off on healing. See, what happens is, you know, my dad died of cancer, but he got healed once. It came back. But, you know, I don't stop believing in, the God, in God healing of cancer just because my dad died of it. Because that, my dad didn't write the doctrine of the church. Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, wrote the doctrine of the church. Jesus went around doing good and healing everyone. Last time I checked, that Greek word means everyone. It's everyone that was oppressed of the devil. It even says who the author of it was. Okay, so if I back off of the message, and if you do in anything, what you've done is that you've, you hand the baton in the race to the next generation in a very, very bad way. So they got to make up for what you didn't do in a relay race. So if you run your leg slow, well, it still culminates to the end time and then the the other people that are running well, you know, and that's why I, I thought it was a great honor to be the, the you know, the, 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 last, the last one in a relay race. You know, what an honor, because, you know, that was the best. You know, they, you're, you're the best, but what, you, what it was is I had, to, I had to make up for everyone else's mistake. I had to make up for everybody that didn't do their job. So I was a cleanup. So... It wasn't that I was just the fastest or you were the fastest if you were chosen. It's not just that. It's you've got to be as good as they weren't. Because you've got to add up everything that they didn't do to your time. And so you have to do that. You have to get rid of that too. So not only do you have to run your, your mile in under four minutes or under five minutes, whatever. You've got to make up for each one of their legs if they were doing whatever what the relay was in order to get the winning time, it still comes down to a certain time and a certain, a certain accomplishment. If you, do, if, you, if you back off, all you're doing is handing it off to someone else. And that's why the body suffers. That's why Paul said, if one part of the body suffers, then the whole body suffers. That's why. It's because, it's because uh, we need each other because God didn't, he distributed his, his, himself throughout everyone, not just one person or a couple people. So you can't back off of how Jesus said this is to be done. You can't back off it no matter what. Now, when you die, there's no pain. When I died, there was no pain. I didn't even know. I had to be told how I died. I didn't know how I died. I didn't know that I had died. I was looking at my body on the operating table. I said, oh, wow, that looks like me. I didn't even get it. Because I'm, I'm serious. It was, it was, if I would pass away in front of you, I would just fall. Everybody would start doing CPR me, and I would be standing right there, and I would say, please do not do CPR. Get away from me. I'm not coming back. I would. I'd be yelling, and I'd be kicking people away even though they can't feel me. But I, I like, don't bring me back. And then Jesus would come in right there and he'd start talking to me and we would go. And I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't even care if people cried or laughed. It wouldn't matter to me because I had finished my race and there was no pain. And I'm like, why are you even crying over this? I would be mad at you all if you started crying. Because like, no, don't. You come too. 
Finish your race and come too. I'm serious. And that's the way it was. So this life is worth nothing except what you did that Jesus had planned for you to do. That's all that matters. Not what anybody else did. Who, not who stole from you. Not, not nothing like that. All it is, is I breathed into you life and I breathed into you gifts. What did you do with them? I want to return on that. What did you do with that? And what I found is, is that people that are willing, they, they do makeup, they do the makeup for everyone else. So, you, you know, you, you don't play just one instrument, you play 14. You, you don't write just a couple books, you, you write 53 in four and a half years. And it just, it'll keep on going until other people start to, then I can get below 90 hours a week of work. I can, I can start like unloading things when the kids start coming up here with their guitars and they want to play. I'm like, have at it. All I'm doing is I'm waiting until people get it and then they just step in and do it. But see, this is God's plan. God's plan was always this. It's never been that I should have to rent this place myself, just one ministry, not even ask for any help. Just do it. I don't, I do, I'm serious. I don't, I, don't, I don't do things for the offering. I do it because I'm, I'm obedient. It wouldn't matter if there was three of you showed up. I would still do it because I was obedient. But the thing of it is, is if God can use me and my wife, I know he can use you. And I know that it's not like a big step. It's just one step. And you might already be there. You just need to hear this tonight. But I'm telling you by the power of the Spirit. Because I am so close right now to just crossing over. That I literally, I have, to, I have to, to talk to my wife. And I have to literally stay here. We have to have plans. And I, that's why I turned in all 26 mission. We do, we do uh, four-day trips. I turned in 26 for 2022. 26 four-day trips. That's the possibility of being in four different cities or being in one city for four nights. Already 2022 is already booked up the whole way to Christmas. Already. Because I'm not backing off. But the power of God is so strong. I don't understand how you all aren't up running around with your tambourines right now. Because I feel that heaven is rejoicing. See, I, I don't, I'm not participating in the recession or the depression or the disease of the week. I'm focusing on him. And he's my healing. He's my protection. He's my deliverance. He, his blood was enough. Every demon in hell knows it, but the people don't. Okay, that was my introduction. Now I can open my book here. No, we're going to get going here. Okay, so this is what I saw, if you can take it. And, you know, anybody who doesn't like it, you can get up and leave. There's, no, there's nobody holding you back. Anybody who's online, we have thousands of people to watch. But, you know, if you need to go, you need to go. But this is what I saw the council is. I saw us sitting on a couch in the, the most holy place, which is the secret place. And I saw us sitting there with, with Jesus Christ and sharing our heart with him. Sharing our heart sharing our dreams, sharing our hurts about our children that aren't doing what they, you know they should be doing, sharing the losses, sharing the victories, and sitting there with Jesus Christ in that intimate place and receiving counsel from him. And so you share your heart, he shares his heart. And I saw that there was such a common bond that happened that you were caught up in the counsel of God to where you realized that the, the reason you're alive was so that he can be glorified through you. And you, you realized that the devil had been fighting you so hard because you were such a threat that you would actually, he knew he, you would yield and let, him come, and let Jesus Christ come through you. See, it's the, this is what we're supposed to be doing, is, is getting to the place where we can totally yield and Jesus Christ can start to manifest his life through us. That's all that we're supposed to be doing. And what will happen is, Favor will cause people to either get really hard or really soft. So when people see you, that God has favor on you, that it's working, well, then it judges a person. So, like, if something happens that you want to happen to you and it doesn't happen to you, 
you have to deal with the fact that they get what you wanted and you have to fight jealousy. And so, you know, Cain fought that with Abel because Abel did the right thing and the sacrifice was accepted because Abel did exactly what he was supposed to do. But the reason why Cain's was not accepted is because he did not do what God asked him to do. It wasn't his best. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't redemptive. So when, 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 when Abel took the first of his flock and sacrificed it, gave it to the Lord, that was pleasing because blood was shed. The earth was cursed. So the fruit of the earth doesn't have the same redemptive value. So what happened was, is the biggest problem was that Cain needed to go to his brother and get a lamb. But he wouldn't do that. And God came and said, don't you know that if you do right, you're, you will be accepted. But sin is crouching at the door and desires to have you. You must master it. He did not master it. But see, blood had to be shed. So it ended up that blood was shed, but it was able. Because blood is demanded for sin. That was the first murder. That spirit wanted Cain. That was the spirit of Satan. Satan was after the Messiah, thinking that Abel was the Messiah because it was the seed of the woman from the sons of God. They thought Moses was, was the deliverer. They thought, they, they thought Jesus was, and he ended up being it. We know who you are, son of God. He said, shut up. He wanted to be known as the son of man because he walked on this earth as a man so that he could say to us before he left, you're going to do the same works and even greater works than these because I go to my father. If he had done the miracles as the son of God, he couldn't give it to us. Do you get it? Okay. So counsel is actually receiving instruction on a heart-to-heart -heart talk with God. This is available to us now. Now what happens is, is you find yourself in peace and you're working with God. And you start to see it move away from the curse. It's not always instant. And that's why people give up. So you can start tonight and express your heart to the Lord. Get caught up and exchange and interchange your heart, your vision with God. And that is how I started to eliminate what was me and what was God in everything that I did. So that I could start to know that what I wanted wasn't what God wanted because I had this time with him where I just told him everything. And, you know, I, I'm coming out with a book called, Lord, Help Me Understand Myself. So it's too late, so don't even write it. Don't steal my title. It's already mine. Yeah. But, Lord, help me understand myself. And in there, I go through this. Because I find out, working for 30 years at an airline, that people don't understand themselves. But see, it's because they don't understand God's intention for them. And so people think that it's too good to be true to dream. It, they think it's, it's not fantasy. Fantasy is the devil's word. Vision is God's word. But vision is, a, is actually in Hebrew. If you take the Hebrew idea of the book of Hebrews, faith is the substance. It's the tangibility of what you hope for. But it is the title deed of what is unseen. See, so you have the title deed of what you, what you cannot see. You literally have the paperwork that it's yours, but you don't, so you have it legally. That's what faith is. Faith is obtaining through, through, through taking what is unseen and taking hold of it. So I place a demand on the covenant because I'm allowed to do that. So... When I ask, I believe that I receive it before I ask for it because that's what Jesus told me to do. But it's because I have the title deed for it. I have confidence to God because I know that Jesus said, if you love me, you can ask whatever you desire. 
That's not whatever you need. That's whatever you want. And some translations say whatever you want. I'll do it for you. He said for two reasons. To glorify my Father and to make your joy full. Well, if my joy's not full, it's because I'm not asking enough. Amen. So not, now, that, that sounds selfish. But it's not selfish because Jesus said no. There's two reasons why you ask for anything. It's to glorify my Father. In other words, God wants to show that he, the world that he's a good God. That he, he doesn't give a stone to somebody to ask for bread. Okay? He's a good God. Okay? And he wants our joy to be full. Well, we need, we need some joy right now. But see, as I've been talking to you, I, I, I literally, it's so real. I don't know if you've noticed, but I keep looking over here because it's like somebody's standing there. And I literally think it's somebody's like standing here telling me, you know, you need to quit. You know, it's, but it's not. It, but what is happening is, is the Lord's here. Because there's more than two of us here. And, and Jesus gave us good news. Now, all the people that I know that have passed on, they had words for me. They called me. My dad called me. Didn't even know that was the last time I talked to him. Ryan's mom called me before she died. My manager right here. And she had a word for me. It was the same word that my dad gave me before he died. And I never talked to her again. I didn't know that she was going to die the, in the next day. I can name the person who introduced my wife to me. She told me something. And we had a supernatural experience with that situation too as well. When I met her dad. When I met her dad, he opened the door and he locked eyes on me and he started to tear up. He goes, where do I know you from? He goes, I've never met you. How do I know you? And he locked eyes, and I locked eyes on him. A couple years later, we got the call that he was in a coma and he was going to die. So we rushed up here. He was in a coma for days, hadn't been awake. Everybody left the room so we could just be there. You know, he's just unconscious. I started praying in tongues. My wife started praying in tongues. And all of a sudden, he just sat up in bed and looked right in my eyes. And that was what happened that day when I met him. I saw the day when he would wake up from that coma. And it was, we, it was the same position. And then he, he passed away. He woke up and said goodbye and then passed away. But the look that, when he sat up and looked in my eyes, it was the same exact thing that happened when I met him and our spirits knew and he told my wife he goes I just want you to know that I'm a Christian because of you I'm going to heaven because of you Kathy because I saw God's love in you same with my dad he told me I'm going to heaven because you showed me God's love when I didn't even deserve it and then that's when I realized when I look in all your eyes and I mean, most of you are just my partners. But when I look in your eyes, it's like I know you because we're all going to be together soon. Yeah. We are. We're going to all be together. And the thing that's going to be talked about amongst us is that we didn't give up. We, we didn't ever let go of our hope. And I'm believing at the end of this age, when God starts to move in a stronger way, I mean, I, I can't take it now. I literally am going to have to quit just because I can't handle it because i got to get on the plane and go do this again in California and then in Phoenix. And then I go go fly upside down in a fighter jet for a couple days. And, and I can't take... I mean, this sounds crazy because I had never thought this would happen. But I literally cannot take much more of the anointing than what's on me right now. I, I say that every year and it gets stronger. And I, I get, but I'm just telling you, right, like right now, I like, feel like I'm burning up. And I can't understand... Why you all, like, why it doesn't, like, start to spread. You know, I don't have to breathe on you or put my jacket on you. You know, I don't have to prophesy over because I have been prophesying over you. Literally, literally, I am, I am, if I would just form a line and just call you out and, and give you a, a prophecy, it would be the same thing for everybody, even though it would be individualized. There's no one in here that God does not want to heal. There's no one in here that would be rejected. 
So the power of the Spirit is so willing. Okay, so if, if I'm going to get consulted by the Spirit, what he's going to do is he's going to talk me into my next step. But see, what he's going to do with everybody is talk them into the next step. But what happens is we all end up in the same room together when we go to that next step. And then the whole body goes into the next step. If we would all agree as touching this, this one thing, and that is, is that the turnaround has already begun in the Spirit. But see, it may be that you just participate in it, and then it spreads from you. So, like, like I share this, I shared this last night in Las Vegas, and my other pilot's not here because he took the other aircraft home to, to uh, Florida. But I've got, I've got Tom here. But I want to share this again because the Lord's telling me to share it again just so you can leave with this. You, you know, I was told to get ready. I was told to get ready. I was told, so I started studying again. I had, I had all my ratings, but I, I didn't have jet rating. I could fly one, but I didn't, I didn't have a rating in it. So the Lord said, oh, this is what I want you to do. You're going to start a kids program. You're going to do the aviation program for the kids. And you're going to reach out to the kids. And you're going to start homeschooling. You're going to, do, you're going to, you're going to start a, a flight school. And so we're already going to start a flight school. But I had to build. I built an exact replica of the jet that I own now, but didn't know that I would own that jet. I did everything. I got everything I got people that worked with the FAA that got the parts and did everything right. I got it to where it's, it was so right on. And I started flying in it 80 hours a month. And then I called Tom, who I'd known from Southwest Airlines. And I, and I said, Tom, I said, the Lord told me to call you. The Lord told me I'm going to be getting a jet within the next year. And I wanted to know if you wanted to be my pilot. And he said, we have been waiting for you to call because the Lord's already told us that I was going to be your pilot. Okay. Now, see, he was an instructor in Phoenix, Arizona. Already retired from Southwest. Had flown 30 years there and had flown F-16s in the Air Force and, and, a, and a lot of other jets for his career and then I hadn't seen him in a while because we both retired around the same time. So we started almost, you know, within a couple months of each other. So we'd known each other all 30 years. And he was already told and said, I'm, not, I'm purposely not taking my promotion at the company because the Lord told me that. And he actually went into his, his, the people and said, I will take this job, but I will fly for Kevin Zadai because, because that's what I'm called. He told his bosses, just so you know, in a, in a, in a couple years, I'll be flying for Kevin Zadai. And so today was the first day that me and him flew together. Amen. In a jet that, that, that we own. Now think about that. But this is what would happen. I said, Tom, well, what do I need to do? He said, well, you need, to, you, you need to get out here and fly. And I go, well, I built a simulator. So he said, well, I'll come down. And, and so he flew down here with his wife. He looked at this thing and he got in it and it's even got cup holders and a, and a kitchen and 14 <laughs> seats. It's, it works, fly anywhere in the world, real time. So he gets in the seat. So we did that every month for six months. Every month I flew him down and he instructed me twice, sometimes twice a day, four hour sessions twice a day, going everywhere, every airport. And then the Lord said, now go out to his school and let him instruct you in this plane. And then I want you to go in this jet. And so we did that. In a week, we flew 15, 15 hours, 17 hours in one airplane. And then when I went to get to the jet, we got in and did my, my, started doing the checklist. And something didn't check out because it was broken. And so I, I turned to the guy. I go, oh, no, we're doing this. You, you fix this thing. He goes, well, these parts are hard to get. I go, so the Lord said, just leave your headsets there. You'll be back in an hour and a half. I go, okay. He goes, you getting your headsets? I said, no, we'll be back. He goes, really? I says, yeah, because that airplane over there has been sitting the whole week here. 
and that's got a good pitot tube on it, and that airplane's grounded, but that pitot tube on there is fine. So why couldn't your mechanic come and put it on this one so I can get my jet time? He goes, you know what? We can do that. <laughs> and so Kurt went and put it on. So we're in there. We're in the, in the waiting room because I left my headsets in that jet because I am not going back home until I fly that jet. So Tom's like sitting there with me, and the guy comes in, and he goes, hey, did you ever think about buying a Phenom 300, the guy, one of the owners at the school? Well, while we're, he's the one that's going to check me out in the jet, another jet. And he said, I said, well, you know, I would love one, but they, they don't lose their value. So like even a used one, it's like it's very expensive. And I said, you know, I wanted to just get into it, build, you know, just to get all my staff and everything there, there and then build up to it. He says, yeah, but look at this. New paint job, new interior, the 10-year inspection, which cost 750000 because they replaced the gear. All of that is done. And the pre-buy inspection, which is 20000 somebody else paid for it. So they had all, all these people had fallen through on the financing, four different sales had fallen through, but they had done everything they asked them to do, and then it fell through. But God was just getting that jet, jet ready for me. So literally, the price, literally, when we bought, like now it's worth about two million more than what we bought it. We've only had three months. It went, the next day was worth almost 750,000. Because we bought it at the bottom. Okay, so that happened while we were just sitting at the table. We saw, and Sven, you'll meet him. I bought it from him. He had to fly home this morning but with the other jet. But he, he I bought it from him. He, he came out with the jet. I said, I'm buying the jet. Just fly it out. So he flew it to our house. And I just said, I don't know what the holdup is. We're going to buy it. He goes, Kevin, we've had so many people fall through. You just need to show us some money. I said, well, here it is. He's like, you're going to pay cash? I said, yeah, it's done. So today... After all that practice and everything, Tom went to training first, and then I got trained as a, as a second in command, as a first officer. I passed mine, he passed his. Today was the first flight together over a dream that started a year ago. Did, did you follow everything I just said, or do I need to say it all again? No, no think about it. Now, th this man's here. He can attest that everything I'm telling you is true. But see, God didn't just give me the jet. He gave me a vision and he gave me something that was a substance of what I hoped for. And I just, I just did what King David did. I just practiced with no plane. But honestly, the, the, the higher ups, you know, Sven is designed, helped design that airplane. The guy I bought it from, it's, it's, the one we have is the, what, the first one. There were three models that they used for testing we're number four. This is the one that went out on the line first. And we have that. Sven was the spokesman and the, the approving per, the pilot for that. Some of the manuals that we study from, they wrote, him and, him and Luke. But they were, they were like, how did you just do that? They let me fly. And they're like, I said, well, I've been practicing for six months. With what? <laughs> and I built something that was not, but I acted as though it was. <laughs> and this is what I want to leave you with. The counsel of God can be only taken as a child. You have to learn to dream again. You have to learn to let things be more simple and let God love you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is the counselor. He only speaks the truth. He is truth. He leads you into all truth. He's the spirit of reality. At what point is he more real than the people that are mocking you? At what point would you rather choose him, even if it meant you losing everything? Because you're not going to lose everything. It's a test. Yes. This is all a test. Right. And it's real. Yeah. Everybody stand.
Julie, you can come. And now, how many of you have felt, felt the power of God? You've been prayed for, you've had hands laid on you, you've, you've encountered God's presence and power, but, but it goes away, doesn't it? After you encounter someone laying hands on you. So what I'm doing is I'm doing a favor to everyone by not forming a prayer line, not prophesying over individuals, because I could do that. The gifts are in there to do that. However, I know a better way. The better way is to be perfected in the love of God, to where you're a good receiver yourself. And you don't need somebody to tell you what God's saying. You don't need somebody to lay hands on you because you can receive yourself and then God gets all the glory for it. The maturity level has to come to this place and people have done us a favor when they haven't helped us when we needed to just do it ourselves. What I can do is I can preach the word from the anointing and I can tell you that God's a good God and that he's not doing all these terrible things to you and that he has good plans for you and that his word is always gonna be true and every man's gonna be a liar. I can tell you Every one of you, I could pick out any one of you and I might just do it. But I could tell you, this is what the Lord is saying. And it would be so good that you think, how could that happen? And then a year from now it happens. Because it happens all the time. As I'm preaching, it takes sometimes a year. But people always write me and say, you were in a meeting and all of a sudden the Spirit told you to tell people that wombs were opening up. And that night I conceived. And I have a son and I named them your name because my womb opened up that night I, I get I get people telling me that and it's just in the last few weeks it's been several and all I did was I was praying in the spirit and I interpreted my tongues and I said wombs are open now that that really doesn't really make me a prophet but it makes me a vessel to be able to relay information about the counsel of God to, to, to people that could hear it. But it was an innumerable amount of people. But if I would have just pulled out Sally and said, your womb is gonna open, well, it's nice that her womb opened, but what about the others that need their womb open? See, so what happens is if I just do one, then I, people don't know that the word is gonna go out and it's for everybody. And I feel like it got out of hand the way that was being done. But right now, I know that God wants to heal in here. And I know that God wants to do supernatural things for your, for your finances. I know that. I know that there's a lot of you that are facing, I mean, I'm hiring people that are told, that, you know, if you don't, if you don't do this, uh, you're fired. It's like, well, no, they're not fired because you're gonna work for me. And there was no over, there was no, not, not even nothing, no overlap, no nothing. Bang, just like that. So God can do that just that quickly. You just have to hook up and sit with him as a child on the couch and hear from him. Now, I am not going to get, I'm not going to go and leave here tonight until I know that you're going to accept that your God is good and that he is not doing all these terrible things to you. That this is a test. That the church of the living God is, is the most powerful institution on the earth. The church of the living God, the body of Christ is supposed to be the most powerful that the gates of hell can't prevail against it. What you saw was you saw the gates of hell prevail against your government or your family members or your, you know, whatever. You could just name it. Hopefully not your church. So what happens is, is I, I, you can do this. If you study the Bible, you can hear me. If you study your Bible, every time this happens in history, it goes to where there's a separation, a falling away, and a remnant is there. And then every single time it is scriptural that people that are raised up to be leaders will gather the remnant together and, and bring them together and encourage them and start to fortify again. And that is exactly what's happening here. That's why I'm here tonight. I'm here to speak to those who have been chosen in this generation, at this time, in this region, 
because God knows every person that would ever live and where they would live on the earth and what generation they would be in. He already knows that. And Satan knows that you're very, very powerful in the spirit. He knows that if you completely turn over yourself to him, to where the Holy Spirit has your temple, and the Holy Spirit has you, that there is nothing that you won't be able to do. God said that about the Babylonians when Nimrod decided to build a tower that was profane to contact the heavens. It's not to reach the heavens, it's to contact the heavens. You couldn't build a tower high enough to reach the heavens, but you could build one that can contact the heavens. And God said, if we don't go down there and stop them, there's nothing that they won't be able to do that they imagine. The word there is imagine. Whatever they would image, they would be able to do. If we don't go down there and stop them, they'll succeed at anything they imagine. Read it. Okay, so this is where Satan attacks you, is in your imaging. God gave you that ability to image because it's the title deed of things not seen. Is there anybody that just catches this? I am not going to leave. I didn't fly all these miles to not deliver your package to you. And I will not leave here until I know in my spirit that you've received this. Satan was dispersed on the earth because God decided that they had unity. But what they believed was evil. Now, we have the truth, but we don't have unity. Don't you think Satan is part of doing this? He knows that if we have unity and we have the truth, that anything we imagine, we will get. I'm just quoting God. God had to come off his throne and come down. It says he came down and stopped them by confusing them. So they couldn't talk to each other. What do you think just happened? Six feet, buddy. Think about it. It's because the move of God had started. The move of the Spirit, the last day move of the Spirit had begun. That the prayer warriors had prayed in. And what happened was exactly the month that I was told it would start three years prior is when this all started. So by February, just one month later after it had started, we had all these plans. And the Lord said, we're going to this, homeschooling. Warrior fellowships, you're going to the people in their homes because they're not going to be able to get out. You're going to come to them, get food, get water, get everything, start, start to gather everything. Warrior chat, our own Facebook. You're going to get your email and it looks like it's going to be possibly within the next week. You're not going to be censored in any way. You're going to be able to communicate between each other and talk about God and encourage each other. And it's, and Warrior Publishing just published my last two books last week on Warrior Publishing, our own, our own publishing company. Well, that's what the Lord was saying. He's saying, you go to the people. You go to the children. He said, I want the whole generation. You start building simulators and you put them in it and you give them a certificate. You tell them God loves them. And you, and you do your spirit schools and you're not gonna have to worry about the airlines. And see, this is what God is telling us right now. We need unity and we need to dream again. So I'm going to impart right now. Now, I'm not kidding you. When I pray, I believe that you're going to receive your counsel. I'm going to believe your dream. This is free. I'm not taking another offer. I don't, I, I don't want your money. I want you. Because I need an army to finish this up. A bunch of warriors like David had. Where they, they don't take no for an answer. Listen. There's something inside of me that I brought back that will not take no as an answer. I will not take no. I will continue to believe and I will draw it out. I will yank it down here. I will bring it into this realm from the other realm. Can you feel it in the room right now? Because my spirit is just expanding out by the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, this land is yours. Listen, listen, this land is yours. You have more rights 
You have more rights than the American Eagle and Shamu. You have more rights. I can't touch an eagle egg, but, but you know, what, why, why can a baby be taken out of a mother's womb, but you can't touch an eagle's egg? You go to jail. Think about it. What about Shamu? Oh, don't pet Shamu. You'll go to jail. Okay? But you have more rights as a human being, and you live here. So you own this place because God puts you here. And if you're from somewhere else, then that's what you own too. You can own it in the spirit. And you start to pray that way. Lord, you put me on this earth at this time because you trust me and you've given me authority. And then I tell the Lord, I hear crunching under my feet right now. I can hear the serpents and scorpions. They're crunching under my feet. I can feel it right now. And I, this, you know, I lived here. Me and my wife lived here. We fought. We, we prayed more than we probably ever prayed anywhere. Well, in New Orleans, because there's, there's witches everywhere. But, you know, it, it never really stops. But there comes a place for overthrow. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for all of your family here. And as the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon them right now, as they worship you, receive the anointing, receive the power to go on right now. Receive it. Receive your anointing right now. Receive the anointing, the yoke-breaking power right now. I break yokes. I break every kind of bondage. I break every kind of lying spirit. I cast you out right now. I said, go in Jesus' name. Foul line devils, go! In Jesus' name, I break your power. I command you to go, Satan, in the name of Jesus. Don't lie to these people any longer. I break the power of every devil in the high places in the government. I break your power right now. Because the body of Christ, we all agree. The blood of Jesus is stronger. The blood of Jesus. No more. No more. Someone's got to stand up and say, put a stop to it. I'm putting a stop to it. I was a resident here. I paid taxes here. I have every right to say this is God's country. I have every right to pray for a miracle in this country and in this place. Do you have a mic for me? The Spirit, the Spirit is not letting me go. I want to go, but He's, he's not letting me go because he, you, you have no idea how important you are and God loves you. You are, you're here for a reason. Righteousness shall reign. Thank you, Father. You can just tell the Father that, um, like Kevin was saying, you know, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And part of the earth is Washington State. And so you can just tell the Father, Lord, Lord, I want my state. Let's just say that, Lord, I want my state. Oh, my state. We want our state. We go down on record in saying we want our state. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful, beautiful state of Washington, Lord. We thank you. We set it aside as holy as unto you. We cover it in the blood of Jesus. We, we stand in agreement with heaven for your original purpose for this state. We thank you for this region, Lord, that it fulfills its destiny in your plan, Lord, for redemption. Lord, we pray for the, uh, the doors of the gospel to be open in this state. Lord, we pray for the pulpits in this state, we, that the word of God will proceed off the pulpits in this state as a fire, as a fire. We say, let the prophet speak. Let the prophet speak. We declare increase of prophetic release in this state and in this nation. We declare the sounds of heaven released in this state and in this nation and in our world. And, you know, we're going to just spend a little time here praying in the Spirit and worshiping. You if you can stay longer, please do, because the Lord wants to seal in some things well, it, right? in your heart, right in your lives. And if you have ever seen, you can actually create, 
no, I don't know what, it's like a Bashanongora Masande Ishto. It's like Mount Rainier. There's pictures of Mount Rainier where Mount Rainier actually creates its own weather. Think of yourself like that. As you begin to worship and pray in the spirit, you create your own weather for your life and your family's life. You will create your own weather, the weather of heaven on earth as it is in heaven. So as you open yourself up, it's not just for you. It's for your family. It's for your family's families, for your children's children, to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And God is here so powerfully tonight and there's so much he wants to give you. He is so happy. His heart is so full. So as we worship and pray right now in the spirit, receive. You're going to be giving, but allow yourself also to giving and receiving. Lift up your voices. Thank you, Father. We're so thankful, Lord. Hallelujah. Lift up your voices. Lift up your voices. Hamakor sing in the spirit ha 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 <laughs> laugh in the spirit hallelujah there's freedom it's okay to be happy it's okay to be happy it's okay to be beautiful you are his beautiful children you're his beautiful bride Halamoramande. the glory of the Lord is on you the glory of the Lord reigns the reign of your glory Lord your glory reigns your glory reigns your glory reigns your glory reigns thank you Lord Sounds of heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ora mamande ande una naya na ula galano unya na 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 uriya na 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 lift up your voice ula vaya ya ya ula na 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 ora baba se ora baba ba se. Yes, go shudo doshte, ishte, ushare de 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 do 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 shto, shudo do do. Pastor Mr. Ask of me, ask of me, and I will reveal it to you. Ask of me, and I will give it to you. Ask of me your nation. Ask of me the America. And I will give it to you. It belongs to you. So le mette rotto te de la se. So re la mandere in matere bo so rotto io ero bona sene di ele la santo. This is this is the time that you have to stand and stand strong and stand and say enough is enough. You take your land back because I have purchased it with you. I have paid a dear price. It is belong to you. America is belong to you. Stand and take it back.
So we lift up Jesus. Yes, we lift up Jesus. Oh, we lift up Jesus with our voice, with our praise. Oh, we lift up Jesus with our shout, with our clap. Oh, oh, we lift up Jesus. Nothing can hold back our prayer. 
Him, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him for His worthy. Praise Him, praise Him for His worthy. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. So make us like a child again. Lord, we want to dream again. Your big, 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 big God dreams with you. So make us like a child again. We just want to dream again with you. We just want to dream your big, 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 big dreams you have for Seattle. Mm. And the dreams you have for Washington. We just want to dream with you. Ooh.